New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania. What do these four regions have in common? They all make up the Middle Colonies, an area ripe for expansion and exploration. In honor of their annual celebration, Quaker Oats is sponsoring this short documentary on the Middle Colonies, encouraging investors to further expand into this area of the nation. I'm Zeke Milbrook, and let's take a journey through time. Quakerism, also known as the Religious Society of Friends, was founded in the 17th century by George Fox. Unfortunately, Quakers were persecuted for their beliefs in Puritan-dominated Massachusetts, an area so cruel to anyone like themselves. We were tortured and imprisoned by New England, with no love for the region. According to Stephen Mintz, professor of history at the University of Austin, in 1660, Edward Bureau cataloged the maltreatment of Quakers in New England. 64 Quakers had been imprisoned. Two Quakers lashed 139 times, leaving one beat like a jelly. Another branded with the letter H for heretic after being whipped with 39 stripes. And three Quakers had been executed. We have no love for the region, so we had to come up with our own solution. William Penn inherited a large swath of land in 1677 that is today a part of New Jersey, and inherited Pennsylvania shortly after. William Penn, a Quaker himself, promoted religious freedom and was extremely tolerant. In addition, they had excellent relations with the Native Americans in the area. William Penn signed a great treaty with the local Delaware tribe to ensure that they were paid fairly for the lands the colonists took. Women also enjoyed unmatched equality not seen anywhere else. I spoke with Samuel Howell, Quaker knowledgeable about the rights they enjoyed in Pentwoods. Hey, Samuel Howell, I'm Zeke Milbrook, it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So let's begin. What made you choose the Middle Colonies? Well, my family originally moved to the Boston Colonies, but when we got there we found that there was extreme religious persecution by the Puritans against Quakers, so we decided to move over to Pennsylvania. Yeah, I mean, those Puritans, absolutely terrible. So, better life than it was in New England? Absolutely. It's much better here. There is no religious persecution, and also there's women's rights. Samuel is exactly right. Caroline Baker emphasized this when she explored Quaker women's writing between 1650 and 1700. The first person to join the founder of Quakerism, George Fox, in 1647, was a woman. An already established preacher, Elizabeth Hooton was the first Quaker to be imprisoned for preaching. According to Baker, Quakers believed that Christ was as strong in women as men, and women preached, prophesied, traveled, and published all about the Quaker faith. If you had the platform to say anything to the New England or the Southern colonies, what would you say to them? You guys need to learn um, religious tolerance. You heard it here first. Is it your and Nice to see you, Samuel. Although the Quakers were extremely important in the development of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and even Delaware, New York was also an extremely important part of the Middle Colonies. I'm standing here in the Milton Cemetery in Rye, New York, an old coastal community along the Long Island Sound. This cemetery is extremely old. The oldest grave here in this one acre plot of land belongs to Nehemia Webb, who was buried in 1722. In fact, where I'm standing now, the Purdy Burying Ground, this tract of land was purchased by Joseph Purdy from John Budd in 1685. Rye, along with the other communities in the Middle Colonies, were extremely connected thanks to natural infrastructure. In particular, the Lenape tribe called the Hudson River Monohicantic, river that flows two ways. Additionally, cities like New York City, Baltimore, and Philadelphia rivaled and even stood over New England cities in many cases. The city of Rye and New York in general is full of history. The Timothy Knapp House Archives, built around 1670, is considered one of the oldest residential properties, the oldest residential property, 
Westchester County, New York. I spoke with Sherry Jordan, the executive director of the Rock Historical Society and an expert on colonial life. So, how did the Middle Colonies government reflect English and Dutch influences? Unlike at the time, unlike all of the other European countries, the Dutch were an extremely tolerant uh, country. They, while they, they weren't uh, an empire, they did not have a king or a queen, they had some nobles, but they were primarily a trading organized country. Settlements for them just meant where, what are our trading advantages? And that's most of the reason why they went up the Hudson, because the fur trade was uh, immensely profitable. And the French were in Canada and had kind of cornered the, the beaver fur trade in Canada. And the Dutch wanted an inn, and they found it by going up the Hudson and trading with the Indians of the north of, of uh, you know, above Albany. Uh, it was known for trade, and so it was a place, if you were coming up from South America, you could, to come in and engage in trade. And so you heard many languages, there were many religions early on, and I think that that's probably, even when the English came, that's probably what distinguished Manhattan from many of the other colonies is that it was already a, a very uh, sort of multicultural place to live. In Holland, and well, the Dutch allowed women to own property, so women could be traders in and of their own right. The Dutch, on the other hand, had quite a few um, very famous, what they called she merchants. They started to fight for supremacy in trading routes with the English. The English, on the other hand, had a very different idea about how to claim land in their mind, as well, the first Englishman to set foot on a piece of land claimed it for the king. So they were slowly, all the, oh, the English settlements were slowly making the incursions down the Long Island Sound where the Dutch hadn't set anything up. Do you know what a frolic is, and if so, how did it contribute to middle colony society? Originated around, like, oh, we all have to harvest the corn, who can chop the corn the fastest? You know, uh, all these traditions came up about it. It was also a way for surrounding, you know, villages to come and gather in one area and meet other people, giving a sense of community spirit as well, tying it around these old country, bringing them here, adapting them for this new environment that you're living in, and building a new sense of community around it. Thank you so much for meeting me today. You're welcome. You. Good luck. That's our documentary for today. I want to thank you all so much for watching. A lot of hard work was put into it and I hope you can see that. Additionally, I hope you can see that the Middle Colonies really were one of the greatest places to be in the 18th and 17th centuries and hopefully the incentive we're about to provide helps you realize that. Thank you so much. I'm Zeke Milbrook and have a great day. Dad, if anybody's really interested in understanding more about it, uh, the J. Heritage Center has this guy coming, Russell Shorto, and he wrote the book Island at the Center of the World. And if you want to know everything there is to know about Manhattan um, under Dutch rule and the transition to English rule uh, and how it shaped uh, Manhattan, and, and, and by shaping Manhattan, it shaped New York as well, um, this is like, this is a terrific book. Great read. He's really terrific. Another one written by a local uh, author is called The Woman of the House. And this is about the she merchants, the Dutch she merchants that ran these massive trading uh, houses uh, here in New York. Their husbands were often sailing around making new trade agreements and they would be in control of running these massive trading houses. And then the third one actually has more to do with uh, understanding the origin of slave trade in New York, specifically in Manhattan. It's called Pirates, Merchants, Settlers, and Slaves. And one of the things that you'll learn is we all have heard about what they brought the Angolans over. Most of us assume that the slave trade here in New York was the, the, you know, the Middle Passage that you learn about in school, coming over from Western Africa. Actually, in Manhattan, because 
they didn't want to have to pay the slaves coming through that were expensive. So they had did a little end round. They actually um, had a lot of slaves coming from Madagascar on the other side of Africa, which was a pirate stronghold. And they would come around and they would go up to the um, Jamaica, which was also a pirate stronghold, sell slaves and then come on up into New York. So the uh, heritage of a lot of the slaves in New York was not really out of the, the, the Dutch um, Angolan one, but more from uh, the east coast of Africa and coming around. So all three of those books I would recommend if you just, they're all good, quick, easy reads. You don't have to slog through, you know, 800 pages, but they really are, uh, I think, really illustrate some of the uniqueness of the, about New York and, and its settlement. A wonderful suggestion. Thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. Good luck.